This is uh, Jim Fetzer, your host on The Real Deal. Live from the Media Broadcasting Center. 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 This is Jim Fetzer, your host on The Real Deal, with a very special guest this second hour. His name is Jay Bartell. He has a book entitled The 231 Club, which begins in its description after a successful therapist is recruited to become a courier for the CIA. His ordered world descends down a dark path, leading to sanctioned kills and questioned loyalties, forever altering his concept of self and country. Jay Bartell, welcome to The Real Deal. Well, thanks for having me on the show, Jim. I'm absolutely delighted. And because you begin talking about someone with whom we're both acquainted, Chauncey Holt, I thought I would uh, mention you know, give a, a few slides about Chauncey, who was in Dealey Plaza at the time of the shooting of JFK, and was in fact the third of the three tramps. Chance, let's look at the first slide here in this short set. The third tramps were, by identification, Charles Rogers in the front, Charles Harrelson, the father of actor Woody Harrelson, and Chauncey Holt, often mistaken for E. Howard Hunt, but in fact it was Chauncey, not E. Howard who was in Dealey Plaza, but described himself as a backbencher. The next slide shows another photograph of them being escorted through Dealey Plaza, where uh, Chauncey had been directed to prepare 15 sets of Ford Secret Service credentials for use in and around Dealey Plaza. When he came there, he was supposed to leave them in a red pickup truck parked behind the picket fence which was a parking lot used by the Dallas police. It wasn't there initially. He told me he wandered around Dealey Plaza and saw, said he saw more mercenaries and assassins than you'd find at a Soldiers of Fortune convention. But the, the pickup truck was there when he went back. He and the others were instructed to go to a railway car that would appear to be locked but would be unlocked. When they climbed in, they found it was full of explosives, weapons, and ammunition. I am personally convinced that if Lee Oswald hadn't worked out, they would have been fingered as the fallback patsies where that circumstantial evidence would have strongly condemned them. Here's yet another photograph where we have a, a man walking past. And notice how nonchalantly this officer is, is acting with his weapon down. That's not in a proper carry. Notice in the background, the weapon is being carried properly, but no one ought to be walking through them. This, this figure has been identified as none other than Air Force General Edward Lansdale, who many of us believe actually was the one who orchestrated the assassination by locating the shooters, of whom I have identified six, by location, name, rank, serial number, the shots they took and their effects, and, and the sequence in which they would be taken. We have additional photographs, as the next slide shows, of none other than you see in the top left, George Herbert Walker Bush, who, believe it or not, was actually in the Dow Tech supervising a hit team involving an anti-Castro Cuban by the name of Tony Nestor Escadro, who fired three shots with an unsilenced Mannlicher Carcano, the only unsilenced shots fired that day. Bush was arrested coming out of the building, identified himself as a Houston oil man, taken downtown but not booked. We even have photographs of W in Dealey Plaza looking lost because he doesn't know where his father is. I may have been the first to identify Bush in this photograph, which was published in Jesse Curry, the former chief of police of Dallas, uh, JFK assassination file, which, which he published with uh, 7-Eleven stars where he became head of security. And you see the, the Bush persona in the lower left. But here's another photograph, Lansdale waiting to speak to Bush. Bush appears to have been in charge of the Bay of Pigs invasion, by the way, which was codenamed Operation Zapata. The name is the Bush oil drilling family. I believe if it had been a success, uh, Zapata would have had the concession to drill all over the Caribbean basin. Two of the ships were rechristened Barbara and Houston just before the event. In the next slide, you see uh, work by Richard Hook, who has brilliant, uh, published a brilliant uh, article entitled, Did George H.W. Bush Coordinate uh, a JFK Hit Team, which appears to be exactly what happened, citing uh, some of the photographs we've already seen here. In the upper left, you see a colorized version of the photograph coming from, as the next slide shows, uh, the window to the, uh, the, the broom closet of a Uranian mining company that was a CIA asset, which is circled there, which was blocked 
by the by the escape the fire escape and in the right you see it identified in red uh escadero a rather obscure figure nevertheless as the next slide shows has a statue in his honor honor in little havana uh, in, in, in 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 miami uh, and if you ask somebody knowledgeable about why in the world should be a statue to to Nestor Tony Escadro, when the only other statue is to uh, the, the the man who freed Cuba from Spanish domination, uh, he might say, if he's in the know, he took care of business. And as the next slide shows, he's been the subject even of newspaper articles about it uh, because he played a crucial role. The effect of the sh shooting in Dealey Plaza from six or seven locations was, as the next slide shows, JFK was hit in, at four different times in the back from the top of the county records building by a Dallas deputy sheriff in the in the throat uh, by a shot that passed through the windshield fired from the triple underpass by an Air Force expert uh, in the in the uh, back of the head by Escadero. Uh, three shots he fired, two of them were inaccurate. It was such an unreliable weapon known as the humanitarian rifle in World War II for never actually harming anyone on purpose. And then after Jack slumped forward, and this took place when William Greer had already stopped the limousine to make sure he would be killed. Jack slumped forward, Jack eased him back up and was looking him right in the face when he was hit in the right temple by a frangible exploding bullet fired from the intersection of the triple underpass and the picket fence by Frank Sturgis, who was a CIA mob guy that set up shockwaves that blew his brains out the back of his head to the left rear with such force that when they hit motorcycle patrolman Bobby Hargis riding there initially thought he himself had been shot. And in the last slide here, we have the overall, an overall reconstruction of the shooting that gives you some idea of how elaborate it was. No lone uh, gunman firing from that uh, uh, sixth floor window. In fact, no shots were fired from there. But because of the acoustics in Dealey Plaza, the firing of the three unsilenced rounds set up an acoustical pattern to create the impression that those shots had been fired from the book depository, which was indeed not the case. Now, Chance, I know you want to set up the other sli slide. So, Jay, Nazi really had a fascinating life. And, of course, much of the time he was working for the mob. He told me of his uh, encounters with Meyer Lansky, who, of course, was the boss of bosses, and how Lansky invited him to become his accountant after conversation they had had in which they were debating over the meaning of division by zero, where Lansky said, well, of course, division by zero equals zero. And John C. said, no, actually, it's infinite because there are infinitely many nothings in something. I don't know if he ever told you that story, Jay, or how much of what I've just recounted about Dallas, but I'd be glad to have your thoughts and reflections. Well, we did from time to time talk about um, the JFK assassination and uh, how he was there to deliver some documents, uh, about a dozen or so. And uh, one time he told me there were also um, silencers. And uh, the silencers came from a, I think it came from the same shop that uh, he used to frequent in Goleta, California, which was near a little airport. And uh, my father used to go to a donut shop to meet with his men, he was in construction. And uh, he met Chauncey there. So I really met Chauncey 20 years before he showed up at UCLA during one of my lectures on pain control and bleeding control. So uh, he reminded me that uh, he had met me back at that time. I was in high school or just graduated from high school. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. my father in San Diego, 20 some years later, and uh, my father told him that I was a therapist and working, you know, with, with people. And so Chauncey uh, uh, dropped by uh, one night at UCLA. But getting back to the JFK, yes, he told me uh, some things about it. He also mentions something about a drug uh, lord in uh, Florida. Uh, that uh, could have been involved with it, but he didn't go into much detail on that. Yeah, the documents were 15 sets of Ford Secret Service credentials. He was worried about getting the color-coded pins they wear that change from day to day, but he got the information in time. 
He was working then in the top two floors of the Los Angeles Stamp and Stationery Store, explained to me how the CIA has all these proprietaries with these innocuous sounding names. What was great about that, and it was the location where the Alec Heidel uh, ID was made up for Lee Oswald, is that the lower three floors were a legitimate business that actually manufactured police and and uh, sheriff's badges so that if they actually needed a police or sheriff badge, they could not just have a fake one, but a real one. He was directed by his handler, Philip Twombly, to prepare those documents and to take them to Dealey Plaza, as I have described. It's fascinating yes. you were at UCLA, Jay, because my parents both graduated from UCLA. Tell us a little more about how you happened to be there and how Chauncey uh, happened upon you. Well, I used to do lectures at uh, different uh, colleges and universities about my process, my left-right brain suggestibility process. Um, and this one uh, lecture was on uh, how to control bleeding and pain. And uh, he was in the audience uh, that particular night. And I remember it very well because uh, I had anesthetized through my process, my mental conditioning process, my uh, my cheek because I would sometimes take a hypodermic needle and put it in my cheek and then have somebody pull it out so that I could show them how I could control act the actual bleeding as well as the pain. But that night I shoved it in a little bit too far and hit my tongue, which I hadn't anesthetized and it uh, started bleeding. I didn't know it until people started pointing at my shirt and I looked down and there's blood all over my shirt. So I laughed and explained why I was bleeding. And uh, later when I w went to the men's room to wash up, uh, Chauncey was outside when I came out of the restroom and said, gee, I'd like to kind of pick your brain about uh, controlling bleeding and pain. Now at that time, I uh, didn't know anything about uh, Chauncey, but uh, we started to develop a relationship. We would meet for coffee from time to time. And uh, finally, eventually, he got around to asking me if I'd like to do something for my country. And I said, what? He said, well, you're a therapist, psychological consultant to presidential and royal families. You travel a lot. So it would be a perfect fit for you to maybe drop off a letter or a package or maybe pick one up during your travels. So I thought about it quite a bit and um, I didn't want something like that to jeopardize my relationship with my clients, foreign clients, but I eventually said, fine. So one of my trips to Morocco, I'm going to deliver this package and uh, it went horribly wrong where I'm chased through uh, Rabat pretty sure it was Rabat or, or Fez. I think it was Rabat. And um, uh, the cute thing about uh, what had happened is I ended up uh, running, outrunning the guys that were after me and ended up in this building that looked like a post office. And uh, for once in my life, I didn't know where I was because normally I have a good sense about direction. So there's this, I'm looking around and I must have had this confused look on my face because this little kid about 12 uh, comes up and he says something. I don't know what he's saying. And then he saw a little badge that I would carry for good luck. It was a Hopalong Cassidy badge. And he saw it. He started yelling, cowboy, cowboy. So I uh, kind of, you know, shot up in the air with my fingers and he laughed and and then he, he made a gesture like a key. And uh, so he must have thought I was, you know, obviously a tourist and didn't know where I was. So the key, he was mimicking me shooting up in the air. And I realized that he was thinking of my hotel key, which, of course, had the name of the hotel on it. So... Um, but uh, when I came back, I told Chauncey, I said, if I'm going to continue this, I want some training and uh, or I'm not going to continue. And he turned me on to Michael Harris, who developed the Harry's flashlight technique that you see badly used in all the movies. That's where you hold the flashlight and the gun, you know, back to back. And uh, Michael started training me. Uh, Chauncey uh, trained me as far as uh, different things to look out for. Uh, to be aware of your surroundings, how to drop off things, how to pick things up, 
Uh, we had a unique little uh, magnetized box that was waterproof that we put a key in. So instead of having a package that you would, uh, as they show in the movies, where you slip it under the, the bench or glue it to the bottom of a table or whatever, we would have a key and then instructions and code where that key would open up a, either a car or a locker or someplace that would actually have the package in it, or that's where we would pick it up. So I learned a lot from Chauncey about um, how to take care of things when it came to dropping things off, picking things up. And uh, as time went on, I just got more and more involved and enjoyed it more and more and, until uh, we actually uh, all decided that maybe I should take the next step, which was uh, getting pretty dark and deep into into things at that well, time. Well, Jay, I believe Cha Chauncey now, uh, I mean, uh, Chance now has the, your slides up and we're looking at the cover of your book, The 231 Club. I'm sure that uh, the audience would be curious about the name of the book and The 231, which you've, which I discover, of course, from reading the book, which I have here, but which you might explain to the audience. Well, uh, the as I got more into it and was trained by Michael, I would end up loading my own ammunition. And the ammunition, uh, the powder that we used for the ammunition, our 45s, uh, was called 231. That was the name of the powder. So um, I just took that in and, and uh, we decided we were going to have this little club, exclusive club, and going out on assignments. <coughs> And uh, so we needed a name for the club, and we decided to call it the 231 Club. Well, you're welcome to advance the slides. Just tell Chance to go to the next slide, and we'll proceed that way. And you can tell us more about your rather fascinating story. Well, the book starts out with, a, uh, with my first real taste of the dark side uh, yeah, of... Uh, the different uh, scenarios that I'd end up to be on later. And uh, that took place uh, in uh, a Chinese uh, restaurant. Uh, Michael and I were sent um, out of the country and we ended up at this hotel. And in the hotel, he was, uh, we were sitting there waiting. Yeah, there's a, a lot of the time is spent waiting for something to happen. And then whatever happens normally is very quick and over, uh, and then, you know, you come back. But um, while we're waiting in this hotel, he's carving this groove around a chopstick. And I asked him what it was for, and with his famous smile, he just said, uh, just be patient, you'll find out. And uh, later that night, we end up going to this Chinese restaurant, and uh, we walk in, and I'm trying to, from what Chauncey taught me and what I learned from being a therapist is to be very aware of everything going on around you so that you can uh, uh, be ready for whatever, uh, whether it's asking a, the proper question to a, a client that you're working with, or if you're out someplace on an assignment, uh, to be very aware of your surroundings. So as we walked in, I was smelling, you know, the, the aroma of the food being cooked and the perfume from somebody I'd be walking by. And we ended up at this little table in the back. And we sat down, and uh, Michael said uh, there was it was somewhat crowded, and there were um, uh, there was a, a couple that Michael pointed out with a child at a table nearby, pretty good sized guy, dressed I think it was uh, in a red tie. He was wearing a red tie, and Michael just said something like the red tie. So I looked around, and I saw, it. and then all of a sudden this guy. Uh, I notice uh, gets up from a table nearby and uh, comes by and Michael had that chopstick with a groove around it sitting on the table. And the guy walks by the table, picks up the chopstick and continues on. And just as he's starting to pass that guy with the red tie, uh, there's this loud crash of dishes. I mean, really loud where everybody turned and looked. And as they were, except for Michael and I, I saw the guy walking by, the man with red tie, and then all of a sudden just jam forcefully, jam this 
this his fist towards the guy's chest. So I knew he buried uh, the chopstick into the guy's chest. The guy immediately just kind of fell over onto the table. And the guy, without miss, missing a beat, just strolled out the door. And then when everybody kind of turned back from the noise, watching, you know, looking for where the noise came from with the dishes, a woman screams, uh, the woman sitting next to the, you know, guy with the red tie. And then uh, uh, Michael says, let's go. And we just get up from the table and we walk out. So that was my first, uh, they wanted to see how I would react. Uh, and the groove was to break off the chopstick in his body so nobody could retrieve it easily. Exactly. And also, also it, was, it would act like a plug for the blood so that uh, he wouldn't just be, you know, pouring blood out of his chest. So it was, it was very interesting, to say the least. Did uh, you ever learn who the party was that was subject to assassination? Uh, I think it was somebody dealing with drugs or something dealing with uh, uh, children, uh, maybe uh, oh, child slave. sex trafficking, part of pedophilia, perhaps. Yeah, that's. I think that's that you was. Think, do you think this was a bona fide bad guy who was being taken out? Oh yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Well, we can stay on the first cover, Jay, or we can. Go oh no, the, uh, if Chance wants to, uh, or Chance. Yeah, uh, there we go. Those, those were some pictures I included, uh, kind of show, you know, my earlier years that uh, I kind of. Very listen, interesting. Be, so you were a biker. You were a biker today. Yeah, I, I, I was. Listen, I, I don't mean to portray myself as this big bad guy, biker guy. I just enjoyed riding a bike and I enjoyed uh, yeah. the, the type you of look, You look book. somewhat hippie as you look somewhat like a flower child in that photograph on the left. Well, what's interesting is that I took that picture. That picture was taken when I uh, did my first bodyguard uh, work. And um, a friend of mine named uh, Maury Goodman, who was just a, a fantastic person, great guy. I don't know if he's still around, but uh, he, uh, he had this friend called Little Huey. And, and um, Michael uh, uh, Maury knew everybody from mob guys down to – he just knew every all kinds of different types of people. And he knew this guy named Huey. And a funny story is that Huey was this guy that was like six something, probably, uh, you know, 250, 300 pounds. And this guy was like a brick wall. When you would pat him on the back, if you ever dared to do so, uh, you could break a finger or two. This guy was solid. And uh, his IQ was not all that, that high. So he would do jobs for the mob. And so one day uh, he, he uh, uh, borrows um, Maury's Cadillac that had an adjustable steering wheel at that time. And uh, he takes the car and brings it back. And the steering wheel and column is just hanging there loose. He didn't know how to adjust it. So he tried to do it with brute force. The guy at the, the mechanic at the Cadillac dealer said he's never seen anybody be able to actually ma manually move that thing without uh, the proper adjustment uh, lever. Uh, so anyway, uh, he was around one day and Maury said there was this woman, this high priced hooker that had a little boy that was taken by the guy, she, uh, the guy, the kid's father, and she wanted the kid back. So uh, Maury said, Hey, it pays 500 bucks. So I figured, well, what the hell for a couple of hours. So I grabbed my, little, I grabbed my little Walther PPKS, uh, my little James Bond. Uh, uh, I think it was a 380. And so I uh, put on a sports coat and that's what I look like and took her up to the guy's house. And the guy comes out with a baseball bat and he wants to run us off. And and I tell her just to stand back, and I take a couple of feet uh, towards him, and I and the kid's right behind him. And I said, "Listen, we don't want any trouble here. You know, the the kid doesn't need to see anything bad." And as I do that, I pull back my coat and reveal the PPKS, uh, my little Walther, in my in my belt. So the guy sees that, and I say, "So listen, let's deal with this. Let the kid into the car." And we won't have any trouble. So he lets the kid into the car. And the therapist came out of me when the kid was in, safely in the car. And I said to the father, I said, listen, 
you know, you're the you're the kid's father. Why don't you try to be nice with uh, with the lady and and maybe you can you know have some visiting rights and everything can be very nice and peaceful. You know, we don't have to have a bad situation here. So I left and made five hundred bucks, and the kid got with his mother, and everything uh, ended up very happily. But uh, so that's what I look like when I was in my bodyguard mode. I love it, Jay. I love it. The next slide, uh, I don't know. Uh, so, oh, uh, now this was when I was working in, uh, oh, I, I guess I gave you the slides wrong, uh, incorrectly or whatever, but that's me laying in between two chairs with just the top of my shoulders on one chair and the my heels on the other one. So there's very little of me being supported by the chairs. And what I did was I went in through my process strengthen my body without holding my breath, without uh, any strain on my body, and held up uh, about 320 pounds. Wow. <laughs> wow. You really knew what you were doing with this mind over matter business, Jay. Well, see, I started when I was 10 years of age. Uh, when I was 10, um, I my father would send me out to saw wood at night when it got cold for the fireplace. And one night when I went out there, I uh, was sawing the wood, and uh, I looked up and was distracted by some lights in the sky. And when I looked back down, the saw had jumped over onto my finger, and I was sawing my left index finger. Yikes. So I ran into the house, and my, my father was bandaging it up as he was yelling at me for being so stupid. And I realized that I hadn't felt the pain until he was bandaging it. So that put me on a path of trying to discover, even at the age of 10, well, how did, how did that work? So I would study, I think it was Melvin Powers had books on self-hypnosis and meditation I would read. And so that set me on the path to uh, eventually discovering uh, left and right brain suggestibility, which uh, means simply that people that are more left brain suggestible see things and react to things differently than people that are more right brain. For example, if I look at your shirt, Jim, and I say, did you buy that shirt? If you're more uh, right brain, uh, you'll say, well, yeah, uh, I bought it. And But if you're more left brain, you might say something like, well, don't you like it? Or isn't, isn't it a nice shirt? So you'll pick up more from what you think I'm saying than what I'm literally saying. And I used a lot of that on, uh, on assignments, being able to judge people so that if they were going to go in and uh, have some kind of a assignment in having to deal with people uh, before they grab somebody or they whatever they did, uh, I would uh, clue them in on what type of suggestibility or what kind of things they, they should say to the people they were dealing with on assignment. So the next slide, uh, if you want to just keep pumping. Oh, that was me in Paris when I was working with a, uh, a president of a country. Uh, the president ended up dying. His son is now, uh, has taken over. And uh, I worked with the son at that time. <laughs> well, that, well that, isn't, that isn't Paris, is it? Yeah, that's Paris. I was going to yeah. say, with all those bridges that look like the same. Yeah, you know where I'm standing? At the top of the uh, Eiffel Tower. Wow. Yeah. Wow. There was a little guy there that uh, uh, you pay him a couple of francs and he'll take your picture. But what's interesting is that the, 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 the kid I worked with is now the president of the country. I won't tell you who, but the president of the country and is supposed to be more ruthless than his father, who was extremely ruthless. So, uh, but anyway, next uh, slide. Um, I could make an educated guess, but I'll pass. Yeah. Now, remember the movie, uh, uh, those who, what was it, those who stare at goats or something like that? Yeah, the men who stare at goats, yeah. The men who stare at goats. The guy, Jim uh, Shannon there, Colonel, one night, I'm in Van, at my Van Nuys office, and uh, everybody's gone, because sometimes I'd work until 10, 11 o'clock at night with clients, and uh, I, was, I was walking out my office door, and as I said, everybody was gone, and all of a sudden, there was this guy standing there. I can't remember if he was in uniform or not. I think he was, but it was Jim 
Shannon, the guy that uh, that movie was based upon. He uh, asked me if I had a few minutes, and it ended up taking hours, but uh, he talked to me about how he had heard about me and how they were, the military wanted to develop what was going to be called the First Earth Battalion. And I said, well, what's that? And he said, well, we want the, uh, because of what's happening, you're not going to be invading lands anymore, other countries. Basically, what we want, if we do, if we keep our army, which we're going to do, but we want it smaller and smarter and more talented. And I said, you know, that sounds like a really good idea because as most of us know or should know, that normally they're recruiting all these young men from, uh, from pretty poor areas, and that's how they get them into the service, and that's how they develop their quotas. Um, uh, for how many they need to bring in for the different services. So he said, we'll keep it smart, small but smarter. We want somebody that can really do the mental conditioning. And we think your, you know, your process would really be a good fit. Well, what's interesting is I saw him, I don't know, it was the same year or a year before I met Chauncey. So I always wondered, because I never heard from Jim again, I didn't know if the program was just dropped or because of my getting involved with Chauncey, that's why I never heard from him again. So anyway, uh, and then when I saw the movie, I, I thought to myself, maybe it's a good thing I didn't get involved with this guy. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, uh, the next one. Uh, oh, uh, that's uh, shows a close up of me uh, doing the, uh, uh, the demo with controlling bleeding and pain. Jay, you, you have movie star good looks. I gotta say, I mean, you, they could cast you right with that look. I'm telling you, you could you could be in Hollywood. You're talking about 30 years ago. Yeah, well, I never thought of myself as being good looking at all. No, I you, thought had it was great, you had a you, great look, great look, just a terrific look. I really like it. Well, thank you, Jim. You know, maybe you can buy me a drink sometimes. <laughs> Well, we did have a. Uh, did we have lunch that day? In the, in, in 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 that was in uh, Hollywood, was it not? North yeah, North? yeah, that was. You, you know where it was? It was at a uh, hamburger hamlet. Yeah, that's right, hamburger hamlet, North Hollywood. Yeah, we sat tried in to the find a place to park. And you know what I love about that? Uh, remembering that uh, that meeting, you were you were very gracious and very nice and non pushy, and I. I, I really had a good feeling about you but we were there with a guy i won't mention his name but the biggest uh, that guy just a big mouth with nothing to back it up and i remember when we were i was you asked me something and i was trying to answer it and he kept opening his big mouth and cutting me off which which, which you know i I didn't, I can go with the flow, but, uh, you got a bit irritated at it. And I remember when he, the, the last time he did that, you put your hand on his hand to, sh to give him a signal to shut up. And I thought that was so cool on your part that you just kind of not your hand on his hand, but your hand on his arm, his forearm. To, to kind of give him the idea that, you know, why don't you just let Jay talk for a little bit? I thought that was very cool. I remember that. Yeah. Well, you know, Jay, for the way I can't even remember who was with us. I do remember our conversation, but that, that third party, I mean, it's intriguing that you recall these details. He was an attorney. And later on, I got oh, into I know, I know now. I know now, Jay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I know. I, I don't want to have to pinch you to uh, make you aware of his name. Sure. Okay. Anyway, that's uh, that's me uh, with my great looks with the needle in my face. Yeah, you have a movie star good looks. I swear to God. You know, if only we could keep our looks. I mean, <laughs> I uh, somebody a good friend of mine. Um, uh, oh. Um, Anyway, I'll think of it. Uh, so the next slide. Chauncey. There's Chauncey. There yeah. he is. 
That's what he looked like when I first There's met him. There's the man. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, where, would that, where would that have been taken? Uh, you know, I don't know. I, I wasn't there at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But, um, just... God, he was he was soft spoken and yeah. Smart. You know, at seventy two, he got into a, a hassle with a young guy that was like I don't know, twenties or thirties, and the guy uh, I don't know I don't remember the the details, but the guy tried to stab Chauncey with a with a screwdriver. Oh, bad thing and, to do! Bad, oh, bad, bad, bad yeah. thing to do. Yeah, Chauncey uh, broke him up a bit. Yeah, I'm sure he did. Yeah, God, well, he was, point, he actually ran a school for assassins, Jay. You know, I mentioned mm -hmm. this to you a while back, but yeah, Chauncey was a man of many talents. He <laughs> was a painter, a counterfeiter, a forger. Uh, he grew up in a trapeze family. He was an expert marksman. Uh, there were several contracts put out on him where the other guy came out with a short end of the stick. Yeah. <laughs> Well, what's, what's really interesting is that Chauncey was carrying a forty-five when he was around t 10, 12 years old, yeah. because he, he, you know, he lived up where they were, uh, uh, where moonshine was a big industry, and there was a lot of people getting killed in shootouts, et cetera. And uh, but he also, I don't know if you mentioned it, but he was also a pilot. When he was around 13, 14, he would walk the wings of planes in in circuses in order for uh, to get uh, a trade-off of flying lessons. That's how he learned how to become a pilot, by, do, by doing that. By He would do the stunt work on the, on the wings if the guy would teach him how to fly. Well, that was, that was quite an interesting Well, story. you mentioned, of course, loading your own ammo. So Chauncey would load and then test it. And his daughter, Karen, told me a wonderful story about how he had just done a load and wanted to test it. So he fired through a phone book. And he said, uh, asked Karen, he, she, he said, uh, did you hear that? She said, no, Dad, but it made a hell of a noise when it hit the barn. And he realized yeah. he'd, uh, you know, going to have to cut back a bit on the, on the load. You know, what, I was, um, I, I competed in, uh, in combat shooting uh, style um, competition. And um, I... The thing that really irritated me was I, I'm very competitive and I really wanted to really compete heavily. So, but I ended up in the, in the top 10, 14 in the world, uh, Ipsic shooting. And, uh, so I, I was happy with that, but I was always experimenting with different loads. And, uh, if you want to read about the, the, I mean, the genius, the mad scientist of, uh, guns, uh, who created the first, wide body uh, handgun. Uh, now you see them all the time with 14 rounds and 16 rounds, 15 rounds. But up until then, normally a 45 was uh, eight rounds and one in the chamber. Or if you got a, a tricked out magazine, you could get, uh, you know, nine rounds total. And uh, his name was Jim Bolin. And I talk about him in the, in the book. And how he created for me, I was always looking for a better weapon when we went out on assignments. But 45 was our, our number one choice. Well, we'd always carry a, a 9 millimeter because most of the other areas of the world had 9 millimeter, not 45. But um, uh, he, uh, he taught me about necking down uh, brass. So, if, uh, because I was trying to get a smaller bullet in a 45 case. So he showed me how to neck down the case, which means making the, uh, the, uh, the tip, uh, say about, uh, I don't know, a quarter inch or so, uh, narrower than the body, the rest of the body of the case. So you could use a different bullet. And I talk about how he was experimenting with different loads uh, prior to the, the Kennedy assassination. And uh, he believed that uh, it was a possibility that they used um, neck down cases so that they could use a different bullet, a more, uh, the, the, the bullet that would normally be in a Kakano uh, in a, a different type of rifle uh, now you're the expert on this, and I'm not. Well, well, well. The, the, the deputy sheriff Harry Weatherford, who fired from the top of the county records building, used a 
Mandlicker Carcano bullet with a sabo, which is a plastic collar, so it could be fired from a larger caliber weapon. I think that was intended to implant a Mandlicker Carcano bullet in the body to confirm that it had been done with a Mandlicker Carcano. But mostly exactly. shooters used their own preferred weapon, you know, and therefore it was important. They took the body to Walter Reed, where the best pathologists in the military <coughs> the different metal parts so that they wouldn't wind up with a wrong caliber slug still in the body before they took it to Bethesda. Re regrettably, we have only about 15 minutes, Jay, so you decide how you want to proceed. But to cover the rest, we, we you know, I'm eager already to have you back again. But if you want to cover the slides, we'll have to move expeditiously. Well, uh, 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 Chance, uh, uh, what? yeah. Okay, there's the same picture that you had. Right, okay. right. So we've done that. These are pictures from my book. So you can go to the next one. The next slide. Oh, that's a medal. Uh, one, of the, one of the times I was in Morocco, uh, I went to, there was a party thrown from uh, for me uh, by some dignitaries. And... And I met this guy's wife. Now, all of this is through an interpreter. I met the guy's wife, and, and she had complained that she had insomnia for 25 years, slept very, very little, if at all, every night. And uh, so uh, she said, you know, I wish you could help me, but I know you can't. Uh, I've heard about your process, and I, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I just don't believe in it. And I said, that's fine, no problem. But on the way over, now remember I said about left and right brain, some people yeah. pick up more from what they think you're saying? Yes. So I said to her, I said, well, on the way over uh, on the plane, I read this interesting article about this scientifically proven uh, technique that really works well. And uh, maybe next time I'll, I'll uh, tell you, next time we meet. And I started to walk away and she says, no, no, uh, tell me now. And I said, well, okay, if you really want to hear it, um, let's go into a room where it's a little quieter. And so we go into this room, I sit her down, I take her through my process, but I'm telling her, well, it's said in the magazine that you do this. Yes. So close your eyes. Yes. Do this, do that. So after about 15, 20 minutes, she's gone and I'm giving her suggestions that fit her type of behavior. So the next day we're going to the airport, my interpreter and I, and this guy runs up. And he's yelling at me, you know, so I turn around and he says, and my interpreter uh, you know, translated, he says, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And he put something in my hand and then ran off. And it was the guy, I, the, the husband of the woman that I worked with. So I open up my hand and there's the green metal. I didn't know what it was. My translator said, my God, he honored you with something that's almost as important as his family. And I said, what? And he says, well... Morocco, many years ago, uh, 3,000 volunteers, Moroccans, volunteered to go into the desert and take over some land I think uh, Spain had taken from them, unarmed. Uh, so these brave individuals each received this, what is called the Green Medal, and he just gave you his. So that was one of the highlights of... Jay, I think she got a good night's sleep. Oh, yeah. Oh, he, oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you. He said it was the first time she slept all night. Yeah, isn't that wonderful? Night. Sensational. Sensational. I almost forgot the most important part of the, the story. Yeah, right, right. Um, I wanted to get it in there. <laughs> okay, moving on. Uh, ch chance. Is it Chance or Chance? Chance. It's Chance. Chance. Okay. There's Michael Harris, and now you can see on the right uh, his famous flashlight technique. And uh, Elvira, he had a thing for Elvira. I don't know what the hell it was, but <laughs> let me tell you, he loved Elvira. Anyway, that's me and Michael uh, uh, at the range one day. Okay, uh, moving on. Next clip. Uh, that's me with some of my trophies. Uh, wow, Ginger. wow, wow. You are quite a shot, my friend. See, Do you see that uh, uh, the thing with all the tape on it to, the, to my right in the black frame? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It looks like a piece of cardboard with a bunch yeah, of... Yeah, I see it. Yeah, I see it. Okay. Two inches that is down, a target inches over from the right. Yeah. Yes. That is a target where in that cardboard-looking area, there's an area of about eight inches wide, 11 inches high. I'm very yeah. proud of this. Yeah. And uh, I was at the range with the world champion Ipsic shooter. What you have to do is you have to stand 21 feet away from a target 
that's eight inches in the middle, eight inches by 11 inches. You have to have your hands above your shoulders. And when the whistle blows, you have to come down, draw your weapon out of a holster on your belt, come up and fire six shots in that 11 by eight inch area. And you got to do it in less than two seconds. Less than two seconds. And that's with military loads. That's not with some 22. That's with military loads. So I'm very proud of it. With a real kick. Yeah. Oh, and the picture behind me uh, is where I won the, uh, God, I hope I'm not sounding too egotistical. No, 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 Jay. This is fascinating. This was your life, my friend. We want the real life. That picture above me is where I won the Northwest Championships, and I they, they really got pissed at that because I'm not supposed to have any notoriety. I'm not supposed to be oh, known. because you're doing all this covert work. Yeah, you know. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, on the other hand, it works as a kind of cover, Jay. I, I'm sure it didn't do you any harm. Oh, yeah, it did uh, help me because then I could go places out of the country and say I was there for competition. Right, uh, right, next right, night, right. <clears throat> and nobody's going to mess with you if they know what a fantastic oh. shot that's it. 21 <laughs> feet, six shots, two seconds. Wow, look okay. at that. Look at that. Look at that. They were pretty well grouped, too. Oh, yeah. Phenomenal. And that signed, the, the signature down in the bottom right is Rob Latham, yeah. who has won the world championship probably three, four, five, six times. Wow. That's terrific. Right. Yeah, I love it. Uh, moving on. Yeah, I always had such a trouble with a 45. I qualified four years in a row, but, you know, when I fired, I was never sure I was going to hit the target, to tell you the truth. Well, we got to get together and go to the range sometime. There you go. There you go. Maybe there we'll you. get some of your listeners, and and I'll give a little seminar or something. Way to go. Uh, Jeff Cooper, of course, uh, he was the godfather of modern uh, combat shooting and technique. Uh, just a wonderful guy. He, I have a letter from that he wrote to Michael uh, confirming that at a certain point I had 23 my uh, CK number was 23. <coughs> so yeah, moving on. That, meant, that meant your ranking in the world? No, that was confirmed kills. Ah, ah, got it. Yes, CK, thank uh, you. <laughs> Thanks for that clarification. <laughs> You're quite welcome. Uh, Jim Bolin, God, I miss him, as well as the others. That's the gun he built for me. It was called the FK gun. Nobody ever knew what FK meant. That he he took a, 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 a forty-five, reversed the rails so that he could uh, open up the grip to fit a, 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 a H and K a thirteen-round magazine. The rounds were th- were uh, long, uh, using bullets that were like one hundred seventy grain, so they were almost as heavy as uh, a 45 and going out at 13, 1400 feet per second. I, I came in, I won the Southwest, uh, the Northwest championships with that gun. I took it to the national championships. Get this, Rob Latham and the others all wanted to shoot it. One of the past world champions stepped up to the line with the gun and it went off about 10 feet in front of him, a DA, an AD, I'm sorry, an AD. And, uh, he says, How, what is the weight of that gun? That, uh, I can't, I shouldn't swear. Yeah, God, it's no problem. Okay. He said, what is, the, what is the trigger weight of that fucking gun? He was really pissed. And I said, I don't know. It's, uh, normally it's around two, two, two and a half pounds. That's normally the trigger weight. So I bring it back to Bowl and he weighs it. It's one pound. Really? So one it had a pound. hair trigger, essentially. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I, I couldn't believe that. I was shooting it all. That I, I got used to it. Okay, next slide. I'm just trying to get through these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's that's me. My stance with uh, with a gun. Um, <laughs> with a gun. Okay, uh, next slide. That's with that gun. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, while I was uh, after I had been training with Michael for some time. Um, and I was working with the uh, King of Morocco. I can mention that because it's been public. Um, I, I was, uh, they, they tricked, some people tricked me that wanted, I guess, to grab me or kill me or whatever. Set up a phony uh, uh, lecture because I was always going out lecturing in Vegas. And uh, so I took the back road uh, to get to Vegas because I, I like driving at night, especially in the desert. It's peaceful, you know. 
So this car started following me about an hour in, and it would speed up and then slow down and speed up, slow down. Essentially, what happened was I tried to get away from them, pulled off onto a side road, and then knowing that they were actually following me because they followed me onto the side road, I, jam- I slowed down, jammed my car, jammed the brakes on, and then pulled in head head in to a berm, which would force them to either crash in, in back of me, uh, you know, screwing them up, or having them go around, then they would be in my lights. Well, they went around, stopped about 10, 15 yards. I grab my 45, swing open the door, I come up, as I see them coming out of the car with shotguns and et cetera. And uh, so I come up and I fired a couple of shots, hit the guy that was in the passenger side in the head, he disappeared, then hit the guy in the back passenger, uh, uh, backseat passenger side, uh, fired a couple into his his chest. Uh, Well, that's where I was aiming, he fell back. Then another guy popped up and I went to the back of the car. And as I'm going to the back of the car, uh, him and a couple of others opened up big time. And then I came up, fired a couple of more shots and took off into the desert. So on foot, I was in the desert, the, uh, you know, all that night, I didn't go to the road because I thought they might be looking for me on the road. So that was 26 hits in my car. That was your car there. That was my car. Jay, you'd think, they'd be, they, they, you'd think they were idiots to be messing with someone who's such a brilliant shot. I mean, that, that's a pretty d- dangerous task to undertake. Well, they, they, they might not have known anything about me other than somebody said, hey, grab this guy. Gave you the you know? gave him the assignment. Well, yeah, see, that's the problem. Most people are stupid when they go on their assignments. They, you know, we have no idea alive. what they're getting into. Yeah, we came back alive. I'm still alive. Um no, none of us got killed on assignment because we went through every assignment backwards and forwards so many times you could do it in your sleep. We got three minutes for four slides. I think we're okay, Jay. Um, oh, was that it? oh, yeah, that's it, I think. I, well, are you sure? I Maybe mean, for the, for the so 17 rather than 20. Jay, you've led a really fascinating life, I'm telling you. And uh, th- th- this book. Let me recommend. I mean, everyone can see the cover, but I've got it right here. I've read this book. I highly recommend it. I think you'll find it fascinating. And it involves some people I know myself, Chauncey Marvin Holt. And I just find the photograph of uh, your car right there all shot up, the one we've just been talking about, Mm -hmm. Jay. I hope you'll come back and we'll talk again about your life. You've had a rather extraordinary series of episodes. Uh, That works for you, Jay. That works for me. Hey, I'll be more than happy to come back and talk to you, Jim. I really have a, a deep respect for you and what you've accomplished in your life. I mean, you're you're a smart guy. I mean, <laughs> I mean, with all all that you've accomplished academically, and I say, well, you're a smart guy, Jim. I like it, Jay. I like it. I regard that as a high compliment. People like you and, Ch- and Chauncey place great emphasis on people who have a have smarts, and I appreciate that tremendously. This is Jim Fetzer thanking my special guest for the second hour, Jay Martell, for being here. I recommend his book.